Hey, gang, this week's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. All you've got to do is cook and enjoy. And my listeners can get nine free meals. Can you believe it? Nine free meals when you go to HelloFresh.com slash GoodSeats9 and use the promo code GoodSeats9. Yep, nine free meals with HelloFresh for a limited time. Go to HelloFresh.com slash GoodSeats9 and use the promo code GoodSeats9. Here's our show. 869-1240. Ryan has hopped aboard the Tad's Locker Room Hotline. Hello, Ryan. Hi. Thanks for having me today, gentlemen. You bet. And uh, mm-hmm. the, uh, just a little known, I don't know, you remember, that, but there was a time in Kansas City's sports lifetime that uh, all four major sports were, were in Kansas City. We had a hockey team from 74 to 76, the Scouts. So the yep. scouts and the Kings. Yeah. And the I wouldn't Kings, have been able to uh, tell you that. That's a good good pull, right? Yeah. What uh, league were they? Were, were they in the uh, Were they in the WHA at that point or whatever? The, what What league were they in? The Scouts. I mean, I think they were NHL. Uh, they uh, huh. the, um, hmm. that team relocated to the to Colorado. Yep. And became He's right. The original okay. Colorado. Okay. Good Rock- call. Yep. Yeah. And then they became okay. they became the Colorado Rockies. Yeah, yeah. And then they lo- uh, relocated to New Jersey, uh, where they are now known as the Devils. Obviously, good I'll good, good call, right? Short time time, but we we had them all four. Hey guys, rock it out. Huh. Enjoy the show. Thanks for listening. Rock it Thanks, out, Ryan. Dude. Appreciate you. I appreciate it. Kansas the City Kansas Scouts. Kansas City Scouts. Nineteen. He's right. Seventy four to seventy six. Then they went to Denver, and then in eighty two they went to New Jersey. <laughs> Yeah, that's right, and it was the NHL. So three years. Played in Kemper, obviously. Uh, no Stanley Cups. No conference finals. Actually, they played in High V Arena. I'm looking it up right now. High V Arena. Well, that's what it's Arena. called now. Right? Yeah, is that what it is? That's what it's called now. Oh, it is? Yeah. The so old, they played in Kemper? Old Kemper, uh-huh. God, why don't I know, why don't I know that? I didn't. Of course, I was three, I know, four, I mean, and I five years the old at the time. I'll be darned. Interesting. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Why, thank you, Corey Coates, and hello there, everybody in listener land. My name is Tim Hanlon, and this is Good Seats Still Available, our curious little podcast journey each and every week, despite all the odds against it uh, into our little exploration into what used to be in professional sports. I welcome you to the proceedings. Uh, You are more than welcome to uh, stick around for a little while and enjoy our little uh, escapade this week as we traverse into the great city of Kansas City, Missouri, and we talk hockey NHL style with a team that uh, even the uh, hosts of of, uh, Sports Daily with Bruce and Shane on Sports Radio KFH in Wichita on – The simulcast, 1240 AM, 97.5 FM on your dials, uh, stumbled through. They couldn't figure out that there was this actual team. As our new pal, Ryan, whatever your last name is, who called in uh, that that day last year on the big show uh, out there in Wichita. Yes, indeed, Kansas City had an NHL hockey franchise for a good two years. Uh, And uh, that's the conversation that we're going to focus on today. That sort of uh, brief blip of hockey goodness, or or maybe not so goodness, uh, with our guest this week, probably the best named guest we've ever had. Troy Treasure is his name. Yes, it's Troy Treasure, and we're told that is that is his real name, and and it's an awesome name, and it's an awesome conversation. And the reason we're talking to Troy is because he wrote what is uh, arguably, not even arguably, the, it, without question, the definitive book about the history of this two year. Yes, only two-year franchise in the NHL in the 1970s called the Kansas City Scouts. The book is called Icing on the Plains, the Rough Ride of Kansas City's NHL Scouts. And indeed, uh, as Bruce and Shane now know, they were uh, in the NHL, these Kansas City Scouts. And uh, if you're a Colorado, uh, well, you know, if you're a Colorado Avalanche fan, uh, you probably uh, owe it to yourself to listen hard to this story because the team in the NHL that preceded the Colorado Avalanche, so known as the Colorado Rockies. And uh, that's where the team moved 
after the 76 season from Kansas City. Uh, they were there for about a good six or so seasons. And then they moved to the great state of New Jersey, where in 1982 they became and still remain the New Jersey Devils uh, in the then Brendan Byrne Meadowlands Arena. And uh, that's where yours truly kind of uh, kind of really got uh, uh, interested in the sport of hockey during uh, his growing up years. Uh, and it was the third major professional hockey team in the New York City metropolitan area, defying all the odds of that. And still is the case. So hockey uh, uh, probably is, is an amazing story in the New York metropolitan area and that there are three. And for a time, I guess you could even count Hartford, the Whalers, uh, conversation we had a number of uh, months ago with the Whaler guys. You can look that one up on the uh, the old website at goodseatstillavailable.com. Uh, arguably, that was the fourth sort of metropolitan area franchise. So hockey is very uh, alive and well, thank you very much, in the New York metropolitan area and the New Jersey Devils, who owe their, uh, their history and, frankly, their origins to the 1974 to 1976 experiment, I guess, uh, known as the Kansas City Scouts. And we're going to get into all the craziness, uh, as you might imagine, uh, with our guest, Troy Treasure, uh, just coming up in uh, in mere moments. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, you and Ryan and Bruce and Shane and everybody else there in listener land uh, will uh, get a little bit of a, a, a more information and education about uh, a team that uh, should not be forgotten. And uh, you're going to find out why in just a minute. So stay tuned. And uh, it's Scouts Day here on the big show. Uh, before we get there, we want to say... Hello and welcome, of course, to one of our great sponsors, one of our longest time sponsors, and a very apropos sponsor at that this week, and that's 503 Sports, the king of throwbacks. 503 Sports, our pal Dustin Alameda uh, out there in uh, beautiful Portland, Oregon, uh, and 503-sports.com. That's the website to check out uh, all kinds of great throwback and uh uh, you know, memories of yore. A lot of teams that uh, don't longer exist anymore are the things we like to relish in and obsess about on this show. Uh, and 503 Sports uh, is uh, a kindred spirit, if you will. And uh, they are well worth your time and certainly worth your consideration uh, for a purchase or two of some fine garb at 503-sports.com. And of course, the promo code SEATS, S-E-A-T-S, SEATS. That's the promo code for 10% off all of your purchases. And of course, this week, it's perfectly aligned because there are uh, great Kansas City Scouts things available for you. Uh, they've got a crew sweatshirt uh, with that cool Kansas City Scouts logo or perhaps the Kansas City Scouts hoodie. Uh, maybe you're into some uh, some headwear. How about the Kansas City Scouts snapback hat with that uh, cool looking KC logo on it? Uh, there's, uh, let's see, a color crew sweatshirt featuring the logo and uh, not to be outdone, and pro the only place you're going to find this is a uh, handcrafted, custom-made Kansas City Scouts jersey. Uh, it's done uh, to uh, the exact specifications, uh, the color scheme, and all of it, uh, with the logo in in the beautiful blue uh, and uh, red and yellow trim. Uh, and even you can, I think that's the home version, right? That's probably the home color version, right? That that deep blue with the, with the red and, and yellow trim. But you can also get the uh, away jersey or whatever, the alternate, which is all white uh, with uh, uh, the piping of yellow and uh, and red with a sort of a nice little uh, blue liner on top of it. So whatever color uh, scheme that uh, you'd like of the old Kansas City Scouts, either the uh, blue, what I think is home jersey, or the away, what I think is is the white jersey, uh, that is yours, and you can customize it. You can get your name on the on the back. You can get the number uh, that you'd like. Uh, if you want a captain's patch or an alternate captain's patch, you can get that too. It's all customizable, and uh, you better, uh, if you're interested in getting that or any of the other uh, great uh, custom-made jerseys, uh, you probably want to get your act together in the next couple of weeks because if you want it for Christmas Day, uh, I believe the final day uh, to get your custom order in for things such as this Kansas City Scouts jersey. Uh, is November the 20th. And that's only, as we're recording this, uh, you know, maybe about uh, nine, 10 days away. So rush, uh, run, don't walk to 503-sports.com and uh, use that promo code SEATS to get 10% off all of your purchases, including all the great Kansas City Scouts stuff that they've got, including, of course, the Kansas City Scouts jersey, uh, custom made, and uh, you're going to love it. You're going to be the envy of all your friends, whether you live in the Kansas City area or not. And again, 503-sports.com. Our thanks to our pal Dustin Alameda 
and our thanks to you for listening thus far and and, and ongoing for this uh, awesome conversation uh, with our new pal, Troy Treasure. I love saying the name, Troy Treasure. Uh, why with a name like that? Why wouldn't you say it a couple of times? And here's our conversation that we had just a couple of days ago about uh, about the Kansas City Scouts of the of the NHL. It's a great story. Here it is. I was eight years old when the Scouts began, and uh, you know, of course, well now I'm 53. But you know, there are a lot of middle aged people in Kansas City and, and in Missouri that are hockey fans that do remember the team. But as somebody uh, described them about six months ago, this individual described the Kansas City Scouts as perhaps the most irrelevant team in professional sports history. And I was thinking, well, I never thought of it that way, but there's probably some truth to it, you know, just two years and and then they move. So. Well, all right. So let's get into a little bit why. Sort of, I, I'm assuming you're you were you were born or raised or at least had some time in Kansas City. Maybe still do. I mean, I'm curious as to how, as an eight year old, it comes across your radar and maybe why the story maybe stuck a little uh, to maybe go deep on it. Well, I was eight years old, and there was an independent television station in Kansas City. And back in those days, most people only got three channels. ABC, NBC, CBS, but uh, Kansas City had an independent station. And as part of their programming, they aired a certain number of Kansas City Scouts and Kansas City Kings games. And that's how I I discovered the uh, the team. I was actually living in Kirksville, Missouri, which is in the northeastern part of the state. That's where Truman State University is located. That's a Division II school. And I was just fascinated when uh, I stumbled upon a a game one night, and I was uh, a little bit confused. Uh, The same station aired Rollerball, or Roller Derby. I'm thinking of the old movie Rollerball with James Conn. But anyway, uh, (laughs) you know, I'm, I'm looking, okay, this is a big white floor. And people are skating around. And again, this is from the perspective of an eight-year-old. Eight and eventually I caught on to it. And uh, when you're a child, uh, you know, your imagination can uh, can really go across a wide spectrum. And uh, I just became fascinated with the sport, fell in love with the sport, and I've been a hockey nut ever since. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I we you know uh, arguably uh, we've uh, tried to use all of our weekly episodes uh, sort of as maybe a as for me at least a personal excursion as to why the hell I even care about all these teams and leagues and whatnot. But I, <laughs> we, we have stumbled across a a, a hearty bunch, uh, actually a, a, a sizable bunch of people who you know share similarly. And I think the the, the difference is that for every uh, story, every uh, childhood, right? There's a different team or a different sport or a different uh, city or or you know, a remembrance that sort of comes into play, but you put it all together, it becomes a very interesting tableau. But this, you know, these, the, the story of the, of the scouts, right, is, you know, is is almost sort of in the sweet spot, right? Because this is a situation, at least in terms of its existence in Kansas City, there's only two years, two seasons, right? So, you know, the more, shall we say, seemingly obscure, the more interesting uh, we find it. And, but it's not uninteresting, nor uh, trivial, frankly, to people who, lived through it, remembered it, and, and obviously in in times of one's life when, you know, you're young, impressionable, and uh, frankly, you know, uh, have a, a, a wider-eyed view of maybe where the world is going. This book covers four years because the franchise was granted on June 8th, 1972, and then it moved uh, in the summer of 1976. And to give folks perspective on a timeline here... I mentioned the date, June 8th, 1972. That's when the NHL granted Kansas City the franchise. Nine days later, the burglars were arrested inside the Watergate at the DNC. And, of course, that was the second break-in. They didn't get caught the first time, but they got caught the second time. Okay, fast forward. Uh, We get to 1974, and uh, impeachment is is taking place or about to take place, I guess it was, in the House. Um, And in August of 1974, Richard Nixon resigns. Well, a month later, the Kansas City Scouts take to the ice in Port Huron, Michigan, for their first training camp. Okay, fast forward to the summer of 1976. The team is sold, moved to Denver. Uh, President Ford, who had assumed the presidency from President Nixon, 
Just a few weeks after the scouts left town, the 1976 Republican National Convention was held at Kemper Arena in Kansas City. So from June 72 to basically uh, September of 1976, that's, that's an interesting time parallel, I think. Well, yeah, in the mid '70s, not only for all of that, but just uh, obviously the the longer arc of of what was happening culturally there, and and uh, you know, music and movies and all that kind of stuff. It's it's certainly a very different and interesting time. But let, let's 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 back up then to this sort of this this pre story, if you will, right? Because I guess there are two fronts on this. I'd love to ask your opinion about. It. I guess one is the NHL specifically, right? So. This is, you know, between uh, in, uh, the arrival of the Scouts for the 74-75 season, uh, they were one of two expansion teams that year and arguably was kind of uh, maybe the uh, capstone of a, I don't know, three or four, maybe even five year, maybe even six year uh, sort of expansion uh, jag that the NHL had uh, dating back to the late 60s. And the WHA was sort of all a part of that mix uh, of expansion for the NHL too, Correct. Yeah, the arrival of the WHA, first of all, they started up about the same time that the Kansas City ownership group was granted the franchise. And uh, just a little background on the on the ownership group, the one that was given the franchise, well, not given, they had to pay for it, of course, $6 million was the entry fee back then, pales in comparison to what Vegas paid, but or Seattle was going to pay, but... Anyway, there were four groups vying to get the franchise. The one that did, uh, they did not anticipate a rival league when they got into this venture. So that was a strike against them way before the scouts ever hit the ice. But to your point about the NHL expanding, of course, they doubled their size beginning with the 67-68 season, added Buffalo and Vancouver in 70, added the New York Islanders and Atlanta Flames in 1972, and then, yeah, can we come up to 74-75? And maybe they were doing it too quickly. Uh, At the time, the owners of NHL teams back in those days, they... Uh, they were greedy. <laughs> so that's all I can really say. And uh, as I say in the book, they they were salivating over all these expansion fees uh, that they were going to get because uh, it totaled $12 million when you include the scouts and the Washington Capitals who came in with Kansas City. Yeah, I just I just wonder if the WHA, uh, and we've, we've talked to um, Dennis Murphy uh, uh, on a couple of occasions, uh, the, the founder, going into his mid uh, 90s now with uh, absolute clarity of what was going on uh yeah the franchise model right uh, the last one in you know uh, uh, can certainly uh help pay for a, a lot of things to keep things going but but also too it's i wonder if the WHA actually considered Kansas City as a market given they were looking at a lot of markets that didn't have NHL hockey at that time well i do know that one reason why they when i say they the national hockey league they they jumped on the New York Islanders and the Atlanta Flames specifically to thwart WHA franchises in those two markets. Now, as far as Kansas City, I do know that one gentleman who did not get the NHL franchise did look into getting a WHA franchise, but that that wasn't uh, that had no chance because uh, the city leaders. Uh, much preferred the more established National Hockey League. Well, all right. But as we get to the this, the the the, the domiciling of the team itself in a second, I, I want to get my other thread of of intrigue, sort of a, as a scene setter here, which is uh, Kansas City generally as a pro sports franchise uh, home. Right. Uh, we we've had a lot of conversations around certainly uh, the Chiefs and the AFL and Lamar Hunt and moving the Dallas Texans in early in the early '60s and arguably you know putting Kansas City. Uh, or starting Kansas City onto the uh, sort of professional sports map, uh, and then along coming the uh, the A's a little bit later, and they're leaving, and the, the Royals sort of coming there. But, you know, uh, it's interesting because the 74-75 season was not only the first season of the Kansas City Scouts as a brand-new NHL franchise, but was also the first of the now relocated then Kansas City slash Omaha Kings basketball team and the Kemper Arena. So I guess maybe you could maybe scene set a little bit about Kansas City as a pro sports town. Uh, because I would make the assertion that 73, 74, you, you had, you went from zero indoor winter professional teams to two 
overnight, it seems. Well, just a slight correction there. The NBA franchise had arrived prior to 74 or 75, but they'd been splitting, as you allude to, they'd been splitting their home games between Kansas City, Missouri, and Omaha. Funny story, when I was a kid, uh, back during the days of the Scouts and the Kings, I always watched that old mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom show. And I, I, I don't know if folks listening will remember it, but the famed zoologist Marlon Perkins would go out in the wild and his assistant Jim Fowler would lasso all these beasts. And uh, Jim Fowler later would go on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and he'd have animals with him and they'd have fun with uh, with Johnny. But anyway, the, the Kings played in both cities and... Uh, so the 1974-75 season, once the new building, Kemper, uh, opened, uh, it became uh, the exclusive home of the NBA franchise, and uh, the Kings dropped that Omaha part of uh, their name. But, you know, the Chiefs were very, very popular during this time frame. They'd won a Super Bowl not long prior. The Royals were, in 74-75, on the cusp. Uh, becoming very, very good. In, in fact, in 1976, that was the first of three uh, consecutive appearances in the American League Championship Series, but they lost to the Yankees all three times. You had George Brett coming up. You had a lot of good other young talent like Willie Wilson, the outstanding center fielder and whatnot. Uh, the Kings had uh, the dazzling Nate Tiny Archibald as uh as their guard, one of their guards, uh, I guess you'd say he was combo point and shooter uh, because he could distribute, but he could, also, he could also shoot perimeter J's and and drive to the rim and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of excitement with the three existing franchises. And Kansas City uh, had a pretty darn good history, Tim, in minor league hockey. And in fact, the Kansas City Blues uh, – they became operational when the St. Louis Blues joined the National Hockey League in 1967-68. And the Blues, um, they drew very well. And uh, the only thing that was really keeping Kansas City from going to the big leagues in hockey was a new modern arena. The American Royal Building was an old barn, municipal auditorium, didn't have enough of a seating capacity, and it didn't even have an ice plant. So it was incumbent that Kansas City build a new, modern arena. And the National Hockey League told civic authorities in Kansas City, if they were to do so, construct a new building, then they had a good shot at a franchise. So that, okay, so that's that leads me to sort of the next sort of chapter of all this, right, which is Kemper, right? Um, was Which sort of came first, sort of the promise of the building and its construction and, and civic leaders kind of sort of seeing that this was needed, shall we say, to kind of, you know, cement Kansas City's pro, you know, winter sports aspirations? Or was it the dangling of an NHL and maybe even the, the idea of relocating an NBA franchise first and foremost to kind of spur or create the need for that arena, as far as you can tell? Well, the Kings really had no part in the construction of the building and the site of where the building was constructed. And that in itself was a political hot potato that we can get into if you want. Um, I think it was built in the wrong location. And there were other better places, I think, that in the long run would have helped the hockey team and the basketball team. But the franchise was granted by the National Hockey League team on contingent on contingent on on the construction of a new arena. And so the city and the state of Missouri decided to do so, but you had a lot of self-interest groups that wanted the arena here, they wanted the arena there, and and then it, it took a while to get off the ground, and the building started late, and because of that, it was finished late. And interestingly enough, the building was so far behind schedule that when Kansas City hit the ice for their first season in uh, 1974, that fall, they had to play their first eight games on the road. The building wasn't ready yet. Yeah, that was the entire uh, the entire month of October and uh, uh, until November 2nd when they opened up against the uh, 
the Chicago Blackhawks also, uh, frankly, a pretty woeful start. I mean, I think they went uh, eight losses and one tie uh, and didn't even win until the next day away again. Um, but that so that's interesting that 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 Kemper, which was sort of arguably designed to sort of be this uh, one of the major reasons, if not the major reason uh, to attract a, a team like this, uh, wasn't even ready in time for the vaunted uh, start that that could not have talk about a uh, an inauspicious beginning. I guess that uh, maybe was a harbinger of perhaps some things to come. One of the reasons why the building was delayed was because during its construction, there were delays involving organized labor. Uh, there were some work stoppages. And, and then as uh, the team's general counsel told me, I interviewed him twice for this book, uh, you'd have the the roofers show up the same day as the seed installers. <laughs> you know, there, was, there was a lot of confusion among uh, the subcontractors and whatnot. It it just ran a little bit late. And interestingly enough, the National Hockey League had planned to have the scouts host the Minnesota North Stars two or three days before the rest of the league would start that 74-75 season. And then the scouts would have to vacate the building for 14 days because uh, Kemper Arena had a contract with the American Royal Rodeo big deal back in the day in Kansas City that for 14 days in October, uh, the American Royal Rodeo would have the building for all kinds of festivities. But um, the plan was for the scouts, again, to play their first ever game at home. Then they would have had to have gone on a road trip. It probably would not have been eight games. and 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 But that all went by the wayside, and uh, I devote an entire chapter in the book about that opening eight-game road, John. I mean, those eight games were all over North America and back across. It's it was a it was a crazy deal. Yeah, that's interesting. It almost sounds World Hockey Association worthy in terms of. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, it does. Yeah. Yes, it certainly uh, does. But it also, I mean, as some of the some of the early shots across the bow, I guess, with this franchise, uh, it didn't help itself either. So maybe you can get into a little bit of. Just the, the the darn name of the team, which seemed like uh, it was misthought uh, uh, from from the beginning, because uh, the, the the scouts was not the original name. Maybe you can give a little background into sort of how the name actually came about, and maybe what it was originally supposed to be called too. Sure, Tim. I actually I'm happy with the way the name was finally decided upon. But to answer your question, the original name of the franchise was going to be Mohawks. And that would have paid homage to the states of Missouri and Kansas. Uh, Mo, M-O, being abbreviation for the state of Missouri. And then uh, during the Civil War, there were a group of of folks, a large group in the state of Kansas, known as the Jay Hawkers. And a lot of your listeners obviously will know the University of Kansas. Their nickname is Jay Hawks. So they were going to combine Mo and Hawks. Well, the Chicago Blackhawks, uh, they protested because back then, the Chicago Blackhawks, they spelled Blackhawks two words back then. It's not one word as as it is today. Back then, it was Black Hawks, two separate words. And I, I guess I can see Chicago's point of view, and also early renditions of the Kansas City Mohawks jersey looked awfully similar in my opinion, to Chicago's logo and how it appears on their sweater. So uh, I can I can see where the words family might have had an issue with it. And uh, so what uh, what the franchise did was uh, rename the the hockey club after a famous statue in Kansas City. It's in Penn Valley Park. It's up on a hill. I drove by it the last time I was in Kansas City working on this book. Didn't mean to, but the President of the United States was speaking at Bartle Hall to a VFW convention, and uh, my roads were closed for security purposes. So I uh, I drove by the scout. It's a Sioux tribesman, and the tribesman is on horseback, and he's using his one of his hands to shade the sun. As an Indian scout, he's he's looking over, down, over into uh, the plains of the state of Kansas. So so how did that new name come about? Because I, I got to think that, uh, and you know, I think we're going to go on this one, is the ownership of this uh, of this franchise, right? Um, 
uh, rather polyglot. Uh, you and I were kind of bantering back and forth on email about just, frankly, how many owners there were in this uh, motley assortment of uh, of investors. But uh, I guess I'm just curious as to how that new name came about uh, and maybe that uh, kind of gives us a little bit of an insight as to how management was sort of set up or not. I like how you put the ownership group there, uh, Tim. I like how you put it together. It, it was a motley crew, uh, no question about that. It, it was There were just too many people. But I, I think it was a no-brainer after Mohawks was turned down to, to go with uh, – the scout the as the uh, name of the the team and uh, they did and uh, I thought Kansas City Scouts had a pretty nice ring to it I, at least I did as a kid I think uh, still today feel the same way uh, I I don't think uh, naming of the team was a real huge issue for the owners they just went to plan B and and pushed ahead so who of this this ownership group so this is a guy named Edwin Thompson who I guess was sort of the leader of all of this but this this strikes me uh, as similar to a lot of other, we say, challenger leagues, right? Obviously, in the case, this case, it's NHL, but uh, where ownership creation, you know, is either led by sort of a deep-pocketed, you know, uh, usually gentleman from, you know, real estate or some other sort of a industry that sort of a, a perhaps uh, led to his success, uh, or and usually it's very uh, evident uh, as to how shaky this can be, a conglomerate or a group or a, uh, a somehow an assemblage of minority investors, uh, and the more of them, <laughs> usually the more cacophony and or uh, challenging it can be to make sure that, frankly, those people actually have their small little checks. So I'm curious as to maybe you can give a little bit of a sense of how this ownership group was sort of comprised. Uh, obviously, the NHL's got to think through you know, they got to say yes to somebody, but um, maybe it took a little while for the shakiness of that ownership group to kind of play out, or, or maybe the NHL thought that they had a little bit more solid backing uh, than they really did. Well, Tim, you hit the nail on the head when you use the term assemblage. The problem was there was no sugar daddy, and I think the NHL, as it stands today, had they vetted the team and its ownership as as they do today, if they'd done that back in 1972, I don't know if the franchise would have been granted to any of uh, the four groups vying for it. When I say there was no sugar daddy, believe it or not, at, at the beginning of, uh, of this franchise, there were 22 investors, and the largest shareholder was a 20 percenter. His name was Murray Newman, and he was a part of a family that owned a big grocery store chain in the Midwest. It was based in Omaha, Nebraska. So again, he's the largest shareholder, Tim, and it's 20%. Okay? All right. Three other individuals bought a 10% stake. One of those, interestingly enough, was then Kansas City Chiefs head coach Hank Stram. He had just signed a 10-year contract a year prior in 1971 with Lamar Hunt, so he felt like he had... uh, some financial security and erroneously believed it was a good investment to go with this hockey team. And uh, he he only lasted uh, a few years of his 10 year contract because he was fired after the 1974 season by the chiefs. But so you've got Murray Newman with 20%. You've got three other individuals that own 10% of the franchise. Add that up. That's 50% between four individuals. And then, After that, you have a whole group of 5% owners, and then you have several 1%ers. So you've got quite an assemblage, Tim, the word you used, and it was uh, convoluted, to say the least. In the book, I I called it unwieldy. I don't think it was. Well, who who was sort of the the chief cook and bottle washer operationally then? Uh, of that ownership group. I, I, I get the ownership structure, but who was kind of in charge of sort of getting sort of everything started together, the hockey operations, the marketing, the, you know, the, the day-to-day sort of operational presidency, I guess. Sure, sure. Murray Newman basically stayed in Omaha and wrote checks, but uh, to answer your question, you have mentioned the gentleman's name already. Ed Thompson uh, was the managing general partner, and he had a 5% interest in in the franchise, and he was a star athlete in high school in Kansas City, uh, went on to business success. He was well-known. 
He was a good looking man. He, um, he, I don't want to call him a politician, but I'm sure he certainly was. He was. Uh, he wasn't very good at making uh, speeches in front of big groups. And in fact, uh, Bob Fisher, who uh, I mentioned, I interviewed him twice in Kansas City for this book. Uh, he was the man. Uh, Thompson was the managing general partner, and Fisher was the uh, general counsel and also a 1% owner. And so Bob was the one that made the formal presentations to the NHL Board of Governors when their group was uh, pleading their case to get the franchise. Uh, in retrospect, I think Ed Thompson made some mistakes during the course of the two years the team was on the ice. Uh, I know when it came to an ugly end. Uh, there were there were some owners that wanted to try to keep the team in Kansas City, but Thompson had agreed with the NHL to get out. And if these other owners had decided to keep it in Kansas City, if they didn't sell to Denver, they were going to be burdened with a tremendous amount of debt that they were unaware of. So uh, no one, I, I, I couldn't get anybody to go on the record to say anything negative about Thompson insofar as the financials and whatnot. Frankly, a lot of the principals are dead. Thompson's not been gone all that long, but uh, you know, several folks involved with this franchise, of course, have, have you know moved on. They passed away. But Bob is, uh, he's like Dennis Murphy. I don't think he's in his 90s. In fact, I know he's not in his 90s, but Bob's in his early 80s, and, but he's, he, um, you know, he speaks with clarity, got a uh, good memory and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and Bob didn't even mention anything about that, too. Well, how about putting the team together? I get the sense, uh, looking at, at through your book, as well as some of the other sort of uh, analyses of, of sort of the history of the league and the WHA, for that matter, at this point, that, you know, expanding yet again by two teams, the NHL, and in the midst of the WHA's creation in early years, um, it was probably the best of times and the worst of times to be a player, right? Because obviously more opportunities to play, but arguably a more thinning of the crowd, I guess, in terms of quality of play. And it seems like uh, like most expansion teams and arguably a bunch of the WHA teams, uh, the uh, scouts kind of got the short end of the proverbial stick when it came to talent. And so, too, did the Washington Capitals, um, for that matter. That expansion draft in 1974 uh, – it was poor. And, you know, of course, the WHA goes without saying they created a whole bunch more jobs and they were willing to pay higher salaries. And I don't need to tell you or your listeners some of the names that jumped to the WHA. And again, back to 72, when the scouts were granted the franchise, that ownership group at least, uh, they didn't anticipate having to pay their first round pick in 1974. $600,000 on a three-year deal to sign his contract. In 72, they, 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 they could not have dreamed that. But that's what it took to sign their first draft choice, future draft choice, Will Payma from the Ontario Hockey League. 18 years old, and he's making $200,000 a year. And in addition, some of the guys taken in the expansion draft um, were able to fiangle some raises from their previous NHL teams. I think Randy Rhoda told me that he had signed a contract with the Los Angeles Kings just prior to the expansion draft. And he thought by re-signing with the Kings, the Kings were going to protect him in the 1974 expansion draft. Well, they didn't. And um, it's in the book. I think Randy signed a three-year deal that went from 60 k to 65 to 70000 per year. Uh, that was pretty good change for a professional hockey player back in those days. See, that's really interesting because it seems like the strain of the WHA's arrival not only was a burden on on a bunch of the weaker sort of investors in the WHA itself, but uh, in the latter expansion teams, and we've talked about the California Golden Seals and a bunch of others, right, where all of a sudden, I mean, to your point, uh, from zero to, you know, 100 in terms of, uh, shall we say, salary inflation and, and, and costs that maybe weren't even part of the business plan, let alone had there been a business plan. Oh, no. <laughs> well, in, in my book, uh, I, I simply write that 
the money that Kansas City Hockey Associates, that's that's the name of the ownership group. I don't think I've said that yet. Kansas City Hockey Associates was the name of the franchise's ownership. And in, in their worst nightmare, Tim, they did not think they were going to have to pay their their 18-year-old first-round pick $600,000 for the three-year term. Now, of course, the scouts didn't stay. They didn't even last in Kansas City for three years. They only had to pay him $400,000. But, 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 but again, that all uh, that's an exceptional case. Wolf was able to, and his agent, Bill Waters, part of the Allen Eagleson organization, they were able to take advantage of this bidding war between uh, the two leagues. Interestingly enough, uh, Paymont was not drafted by a WHA team, which is uh, slightly interesting. Uh, Greg Jolly, who was taken number one in the 1974 amateur draft, just ahead of Pema, he got a contract, I believe, worth $800,000, but it was spread over uh, more term. So, boy, the rookie salaries really exploded in the, in the mid-1970s. And I, mean, I mentioned Randy Rhoda. In the third year of that contract he signed just prior to coming to Kansas City, okay, he was going to make $70,000 a year. Now, that's, that, that's, that's nothing compared to what's going on uh, now and has been for the last uh, a few decades. But, you know, Randy would tell you he wasn't a star player or anything like that. He was a serviceable uh, NHL forward. And he had managed to latch on with the Los Angeles Kings. And, you know, just due to a numbers crunch there, the, the coach, Bob Pulford, they, they put him on the expansion list. And Sid Abel, the general manager of the scouts, took him. But, um, yeah, I, you know, it blew, it blew the, the proposed budget for player payroll to smithereens simply with what they were going to have to pay and did pay Will Payma. All right, what's this? Hello Fresh. Hello Fresh. Yes, America's number one meal kit, of course. Get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door with Hello Fresh. All you have to do is cook and enjoy. Exactly what I've been doing the last couple of days as we've been enjoying in the Hanlon household some delicious Hello Fresh meals. Not only delicious, but simple and straightforward and easy to make. Hello Fresh makes cooking delicious meals at home of course, a reality, regardless of your comfort in the kitchen. From step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients, you'll have everything you need to get a wow-worthy dinner on the table in just about 30 minutes. Say goodbye to endless grocery store trips and takeout food. HelloFresh has you covered. Break out of your dinner rut with HelloFresh's over 20 seasonal chef-curated recipes each week. There's something for everyone, from family recipes to calorie-smart and vegetarian and fun menu series like Hall of Fame and Kraft Burgers. HelloFresh has more five-star recipes than any other meal kit, so you know you'll always get something delicious. And it's also flexible and fits your lifestyle. Add extra meals to your weekly order, uh, perhaps even adding on yummy uh, uh, additions like garlic bread or even cookie dough. You can easily change your delivery days or your food preferences. Heck, you can even skip a week whenever you need. HelloFresh has got you covered. We love it. Give it a try. I guarantee you're going you're gonna to enjoy it. And here's a great incentive to do so. How about nine free meals? Yes, I said nine free meals. When you use the uh, promo code GOODSEATS9 at HelloFresh.com slash GOODSEATS9. That's HelloFresh.com slash GOODSEATS9, the number nine. And make sure you use the uh, promo code GOODSEATS9, and you're going to get nine free meals, courtesy of us and HelloFresh. It's a great deal. And may I suggest when you're choosing those first nine meals, that two of them be the sesame beef tacos with quick pickled veggies and chili sour cream, uh, which we just had last night in the Hamlin household. We loved it tremendously. And then two nights before that, we uh, also had a, a tremendous meal. Uh, chicken sausage and spinach ricotta ravioli with tomato and lemon. That was thumbs up, too, from the Hanlon clan. So that's just two of the nine we could have chosen, but go for it. Nine free meals when you go to HelloFresh.com slash GoodSeats9. Again, HelloFresh.com slash GoodSeats and the number nine. And use that promo code, too, when you're on the site, GoodSeats9, and get nine free meals. Again, from our friends at HelloFresh. And uh, we, uh, we love the food and we love our friends at HelloFresh and you will too. And uh, while you uh, search up that deal and get your, uh, your web browser and your order in there, how about a uh, return to our conversation? So 
so let's talk about maybe the composition then of the team, the players, right? So you're you're basically saying that the first season, of course, was a, a combination of participation in the draft as well as, uh, I look at the records, a pretty deep expansion draft. I mean, for two teams, right, expanded. You know, I'm looking just at at, uh, at the expansion draft uh, list here for uh, the scouts. I mean, they, it went... I don't know, almost 25, maybe almost 30 players deep, it seems. But I deep, I guess, is with the small letters, not not capital. You know, yeah, yeah, excellent disclaimer there, Tim, on your part, because uh, the draft was not deep. Now, there might have been a lot of players available, but, but uh, people, if they get this book and or if they just listen to this podcast, uh, most of those players that were selected by the Kansas City Scouts, and I don't list Washington's, expansion draft by player and round in the book. But if you look it up somewhere, it, it, a lot of them were minor league players. They were playing in the American Hockey League. And if they had played the previous year in the NHL, like Randy Rhoda had with the Los Angeles Kings, uh, they were fourth line forwards or number six D-man, you know, something like that. And uh, there were some exceptions. Uh, uh, I think the scouts um, in, in the, the first part of the expansion draft was just for the goalies. And I thought the scouts got a, a pair of pretty darn good ones um, in Michelle Ploss and Peter McDuffie. And then as the expansion draft moved on to the next player phase, uh, Sid Abel was able to pick up uh, a very good a quality player in Simone Nole. Um, Simone was a very skilled player with the Philadelphia Flyers, but he he really wasn't a card carrying member of the Broad Street Bullies Club, if you know what I mean. And uh, and of course uh, the Flyers were about to go after their second Stanley Cup. They'd already won one, and uh, Simone was a victim of the numbers. But Simone. Uh, he was the team's first captain. He scored the first goal in scouts history. He was their first all-star game representative. That was an excellent pickup. Uh, Brent Hughes uh, was taken high in the expansion draft. He was a good defenseman for the Kansas City scouts. He'd already signed a contract to play with San Diego in the WHA for the following season. So uh, Mr. Abel selected him knowing he would only be in Kansas City for one season. Uh, uh, Gary Crotto was taken later in the expansion draft. Uh, I interviewed Gary twice for the book. Uh, very good guy. Uh, his story is in the book. Uh, he has a very unique path uh, to the National Hockey League. Uh, he did not play Canadian junior hockey. I'll leave it at that. Um, so they, they got a few good players, but again, uh, these were fourth liners on other teams for a reason. Or they were in the minor leagues for a reason so the pickings were slim well and how about coaching it um i you know three coaches across two seasons maybe you can talk about sort of bep you know uh, as the the original sort of coach but i it, it seems like uh, there was uh, arguably they were throwing a bunch of things against the wall over the span of those two years given the cacophony of of how they were running the team let alone stocking it well before i get to the coaching situation the the other part of uh of your question right there, stocking the team. I, I will give Sid Abel some credit. During the course of his two seasons as GM in Kansas City, he made some good trades. Uh, he got he brought Guy Sharon in from the Detroit Red Wings uh, fairly early in that first season, and it was a heist on his part from the, the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, uh, they got heisted in, in that deal, and I'm sure Sid was – uh, I'm sure he loved the fact that he was able to heist his uh, former team. He did not leave the Red Wings on really good terms, but, but back then nobody left the Red Wings on good terms. Um, later in the year, he made a trade with the Pittsburgh Penguins and brought over goalie Dennis Heron along with defenseman jean Guy Legacy. Uh, that was an outstanding trade on the part of uh, Sid Abel. Now, as far as the coaching, Sid Abel made an excellent hire in the scouts' first coach. Bev Gittelin had just taken the Boston Bruins to the Stanley Cup final where they lost to the Philadelphia Flyers. And Gittelin wanted a multi-year contract extension, and the Bruins' general manager, Harry Sindens, said no. So Bev walked, and Sid said, come on in and let's talk. And uh, Gittelin was not unemployed for very long. Now, he coached through the first season into the second and then the soap opera begins regarding Bep Gidlin. Um 
and during the second season, uh, it's all in the book, but he gets into a dispute with uh, Sid Abel and Ed Thompson about a player. Um, he wants him sent to the minors. He's his players making ninety thousand dollars a year. The scouts are going broke. They're not going to send this player to the minors and pay him ninety thousand. <laughs> and so um, uh, Gittelin resigned in a huff. Uh, Abel was the second coach on an interim basis. He came down and coached briefly, and then a gentleman from Collingwood, Ontario, a uh, hockey lifer who who was already in his 60s, Eddie Bush, um, former teammate of Sid Abel, and Baz Bastine, the assistant general manager in Kansas City. Eddie Bush came down, and uh, uh, he didn't turn it around. The scouts were miserable. They lost their their last 27 games, but... We can get into this later, Tim, if you want. Uh, the Kansas City Scouts, yes, they lost their last 27 regular season NHL games, but they did win their final game. Hmm. Okay. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll walk right through that open door. Go ahead. Okay. I'll, I'll, I know it sounds confusing. Okay. The Scouts, in their final regular season, after that, they played an exhibition series, four games, in Japan with the Washington Capitals. Okay, they played these games at uh, Sapporo up there where the Olympics in 72 were held, first two games there. Washington won the first three of those exhibition games. I'm sorry, and what, then what, in the fourth... What were these exhibition games? What year? This is 76, right? The middle of the second part of the second season? This this is um, the well the, the spring of 1976 because the NHL was going to have this uh, exhibition series in Japan and Washington and Kansas City were so far out of the playoff picture that yeah, okay we'll send these two teams <laughs> and so and and so they're over there playing they're over there playing in Japan while the Stanley Cup playoffs are going on over here but my point is my point is is the scouts lost their last 27 regular season NHL games, then lost three more that didn't count, and then won their last game in Japan, but it didn't count. That's, that's, that, to me, that kind of puts a bow tie or a bow ribbon on this whole fiasco of the Kansas City Scouts. Well, oh, that's, so that's very interesting. Yeah, I, so I didn't realize that there was this exhibition series su- simultaneous or literally in the midst of a season, and that the NHL would be so, I don't want to say brazen, but... I mean, smart, right? but but also, I don't know, not not necessarily the, the biggest boost to one's franchise's ego, right? By saying, okay, well, you, these two franchises we just added last year, by the way, you guys are so far out of it. Go to Japan and, and help spread goodwill while we get the playoffs underway. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I tell you what, though, the guys loved it. At least the Kansas City guys I talked to, they got a big per diem, and they they were treated like royalty by the Japanese, and uh, you know, the Japanese typically are are often petite people and they're they're very respectful and and i know in at both up in northern japan and back down in tokyo the fans uh they would sit in silence at and just observe some of the stuff going on on the ice now these guys there there were some fights between the capitals and the scouts and but it you know they weren't they weren't going to hurt each other i mean it it was an exhibition went on but but they put on a good show, as the scouts trainer told me. Uh, in fact, uh, the Caps and the scouts on the return to the states uh, they they got a they got a comp week in Hawaii, and uh, the trainer told me for the book that he got caught in a riptide while he was swimming off Maui and thought he was doomed. But but you know. I thought through it. You know, I really relaxed and just floated back. But anyway, that whole uh, series in Japan is is quite. Interesting when you consider. Okay, go, just go to Japan, guys. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll have our Stanley Cup playoffs over here while you're over there, as you say, Tim, uh, spreading the goodwill. So I, I want to come back to the demise in a minute, but let me ask you one last question since we're sort of on this little jag here. At that point, when they were going to Japan near near or end, at the end of the season, that seventy five seventy six season, uh, was there any inkling and or rumor or more so? Uh, that the team was uh, not long for Kansas City uh, at that point. Yes, before the regular season had even ended, uh, Jay Moore, who owned the WHA's Cleveland Crusaders, met with Ed Thompson in Kansas City. And now this deal never came to fruition, and 
thus Cleveland got the California Golden Seals. But the deal, had it gone through, would have had Jay Moore buy the Kansas City NHL franchise to span his WHA Crusaders and move the scouts as an NHL franchise to the Richfield Coliseum. That's how that would have have uh, shaken down there. There were rumors already. There were rumors of uh, interest in Denver, uh, interested in buying the franchise. Uh, the ownership of the Kansas City Kings NBA team uh, considered, and I don't know how hard, but they considered buying the franchise. Uh, interest in Miami. Uh, they they sniffed around about buying the team. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, before before that 75-76 regular season uh, ended, which would have been the cal- 76 calendar part of the season, uh, yeah, the, the, the signs uh, were pretty clear that this franchise uh, was in serious financial trouble. Level, nothing official had taken place, but the signs were, were clear. Well, I mean, that obviously signals that that even before the end of the season, then uh, that at least in 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 league circles, that it was probably a uh, uh, some warning bells going off, right? So, I I, I guess maybe back in from your from your uh, investigations, did at what point was the ownership and the league worried? Was it maybe after the beginning of that first season, perhaps, or you know, like those entreaties don't just come magically overnight, right? And I and frankly, I don't think Washington was experiencing the same thing with their expansion efforts. Uh, yes, there were worries after the first season. I will say that uh, Abe Poland was a majority owner in the Capitals, and he had deep pockets, and he uh, obviously was able to weather the the rough early start with his hockey franchise. Of course, he owned the NBA Bullets. Um, I'm not sure, but he... Tim, do you know that he might have owned the Capitol Center? I think he owned it or he built it, uh, and so it's always good to own your own building. I'm yeah, sure yeah. taxpayer money was yeah, involved the, the too, old, but the old Capitol Center, the old uh, big potato chip, yeah, right. And and so um, Mr. Poland had the financial wherewithal, and I'm sure his partners helped him out, you know, to get through the lean days. Kansas City didn't have, have that. I mean, the, the the top shareholder was twenty percent. It's it's incredible, and then you've got three ten percenters, and one of them's the NFL coach in town. It's uh, it's kind of I don't. Know, sometimes I think maybe a sitcom could have been developed out of it. It would have fit in in the nineteen seventies, a nineteen seventies sitcom, but uh, WKRP in Cincinnati type of ownership sitcom. But anyway, I don't want to call it a clown show or a gong show. These people. Uh, invested their hard-earned money into a business that failed, and for several of them, it took several years to recoup their losses. Uh, um, but they did try to bring the na- they did bring the National Hockey League to Kansas City, but as a business and on the ice, it was a bust. It was a bust at the box office. Uh, the franchise did a poor job of, of marketing itself. They didn't do any player appearances, and I know players like Gary Crotto and Robin Burns. They both told. Only for the book, they were willing to do them. As Gary said, they didn't want to do them on game days. Well, that's understandable. But people like Gary Crotto and Robin Burns and Guy Sharon and Randy Rhoda and Dennis Heron, those guys have outstanding personalities. They they would have enjoyed going out and going to the schools and going to fairs, uh, going to shopping malls. I guess they didn't really exist as much back then, but, you know, spreading the scouts' gospel. The, the scouts, uh, their PR director was Bill Grigsby, a name well-known in Kansas City, and he wore many hats with the scouts. He was assistant Ed Thompson. He was PR director. He was color man on the broadcast. Well, what they would do, and, and this was according to Jay Greenberg, the Hockey Hall of Fame writer, who was an immense help for my book, uh, Greenberg basically said that their idea of public relations was for Grigsby to go out and give speeches and talk about it himself. He wasn't talking about the scouts. He wasn't talking about hockey. According to Greenberg, he couldn't talk about hockey because he didn't know the sport. But Griggs, a uh, wonderful personality, a wonderful man, uh, he, he was an outstanding Toastmaster. It's just that uh, he was really selling himself when he should have been selling his the business that he was part of. Well, I guess that brings up sort of where was the sales and marketing effort, right? Because it seems like that was uh, uh, not the, their strength. And, and you know, I maybe t- tie it back to your original understanding of the franchise, because you saw it on on a, 
you know, again, a different media landscape, right? The independent TV station, I'm guessing it was a UHF signal, maybe? Well, it was distributed by cable. Uh, actually, in Kansas City, it was uh, UHF, I'm sure. But uh, this was the early start of regional cableization. Uh, the Scouts, uh, KBMA TV in Kansas City was on in the cable, the cable system in Des Moines, Iowa, as a matter of fact. And I I spoke to um, a longtime radio broadcaster who's about my age, and he, he caught the Scouts and the Kings on on TV in Des Moines, Iowa. He basically discovered the Scouts and the Kings like I did. And... Uh, you know, in Kirksville, Missouri, you know, we're we're probably 200 miles away from Kansas City. We were getting it on cable, um, so that that's uh, that's just another aspect of the story uh, about how cable television was evolving. You know, this predates ESPN, and it even predates Ted Turner putting his old WTCG TV channel 17 in Atlanta on the satellite, uh, and then we started to get Hawks and Braves, and even that final year, the Flames were in Atlanta. Um, I could watch Atlanta Flames games in Missouri because of this uh, this pairing of television and satellite technology. But now the scouts um, they did some neat promotional things. Um, they would have post game music concerts, uh, and uh, they brought in some name acts. Uh, now the first the first one that's um, that. It, the group is was fairly well known in the day. It's not a country music act. It was the Hudson Brothers. And, sure, of uh, course, yes. Not only known for their comedy, but they actually had a pretty decent uh, some musical chops too. Yeah, and a variety show the whole bit. Yeah, I, I I remember the variety show. I think from when I was a kid, I, it was entertaining. Uh, but uh, Kansas City, being a midwestern town, uh, uh, they brought in. Um, Freddie Fender and promoted it as a Fender Bender because the game was against the Philadelphia Flyers. No explanation needed for Fender Bender. And they also brought in uh, Tanya Tucker, who was still a teenager back then, but but very, very popular. Uh, so was Freddie Fender. And uh, they brought in these type of performances for post game concerts and uh, um, you know, they probably shelled out a pretty good chunk of change to these entertainers. Uh, so uh, they they did it in that way. But I, I get back to the fact that um, you got to sell your product. And what is your product? It's your team. And how is your team made up? It's your players. Back in those days, a lot of owners in the National Hockey League they didn't boast about their players. They didn't promote their players because they were afraid if those players became popular with the fans, the player would want a salary raise. Okay, probably so, maybe. But but that was that was uh, detrimental to your overall effort. Uh, the scouts just did not get their players out in the public, um, and I mean, to me. If you're not going to promote your players, which are your product, then you probably deserve to fail as a business. And they did. Well, so, so okay, so it's intriguing because you're mentioning a bunch of things that would arguably sound like they were huge positives for a fledgling franchise in, a, in, a, in the dominant and, and longest standing professional hockey league, right? You have regionalization, right? So the team isn't necessarily a Kansas City team. You're mentioning albeit somewhat early, but still, right, broadcasts, and I suspect a radio, quote-unquote, network that, you know, was outside of just solely the Kansas City metropolitan area, right? So that that arguably makes it a more marketable group of uh, of, of audience to, to to pitch to. Second, it sounds like they pull up this, all the stops and put the concerts and stuff. I You know, having talked about other teams during this, this period of time uh, generally, I mean— I, in retrospect, a lot of that sounds almost uh, a little desperate, right? When you're trying to attract people through the ancillary entertainment, right? Because arguably, you know, they're not there for the hockey, but they might be there for, you know, a, a, a soulful rendition of Before the Next Teardrop Falls, right? By Freddie Fender. So, so yeah, that's the name I, of a chapter, I think, by the way. There you go. So, uh, but, and it also feels to me that you'd also have going for you the Kemper Arena, which is brand new, right? And, yeah, the curiosity, frankly, of going to as this little civic pride, but also a brand new big league building, right? That is the pumping, uh, you know, a, a shot in the arm for Kansas City as a true now, especially in the winter seasons, major league sports uh, home. 
for not only just the hockey team, but also the basketball team. So you'd think that the Kemper Arena itself would have been a draw, too. But I don't know. It, it, you look at the, the stats, and, and, and based on what I'm hearing, um, it didn't seem to translate very much for the scouts, uh, a, a massive outpouring and, and, and crowd attendance. Look, they didn't win. The economy from 1973 with the Arab oil embargo, we went into a severe recession nationally, but especially in the Midwest. That lasted until early 1975. Um, they didn't promote their players. Um, they didn't have a deep-pocketed owner like the Washington Capitals did in Abe Poland. So there were a confluence of events or circumstances, and they were all bad for Kansas City's ownership group. And um, I keep getting back to the fact that the largest shareholder was was 20%. You know, I, I haven't thought of this before, honestly, Tim. I haven't said it in any other radio or radio interview or podcast interview, but it's a shame that Lamar Hunt wasn't a part of this ownership group because he was already a minority owner in the NBA Chicago Bulls. He, he, he was a minority owner in the Bulls from day one back in the late 60s. And one wonders, you know, if he had bought 20, 30, okay, 40% of the franchise. One wonders if he would have been the scouts a Poland to, to – to baby feed them along in in the first yeah, look the, the the first years of the franchise this wasn't like the Vegas Golden Knights which was crazy insane to go to the Stanley Cup final in their first year of existence back then when you were an expansion team in any sport you were expected to suck okay uh Sometimes teams back then in in the seventies got good pretty fast. The Royals got good pretty pretty fast. I think about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I mean, what? They didn't win a game their first year. Then what? They won two their second year. They beat the Seahawks as their first game, which was their other the other expansion team. Well, I think they beat the Saints too uh, in, in in that second year. But 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 they, then in, they're playing in the nineteen seventy nine uh, NFC Championship game uh, against the Rams. Um, if memory serves correctly. So John McKay got that team pretty competitive pretty quickly, but, but that was not the norm. The norm was to suck, to be really bad. And as I mentioned, there were a confluence of negative circumstances that uh, doomed the franchise in Kansas City. It's important to remember, I don't think we've talked about this yet, that the franchise still exists. And, you know, moved to Denver. They were the Colorado Rockies before there was a baseball team by that name. They were in Denver for six years, then moved to the New Jersey Meadowlands. And they're still known as the New Jersey Devils, although their home ice is now in Newark at the Prudential Center. And that's where I first came uh, into becoming uh, somewhat of a hockey fan because I grew up in the northern New Jersey area. And uh, the Brendan, it was called the Brendan Byrne Arena back then. And, uh, and this uh, sort of... Uh, you know, third franchise in the NHL coming to the New York metropolitan area. And th- that, frankly, spurred my initial interest in, in this particular story because uh, fascinated by, like, how the hell this team got here. But it's interesting <laughs> it's, it's interesting you brought up Hunt because that was exactly going to be my next question is where was Lamar Hunt and all this? Now, I wonder, and I know it's been, what, a year or so since this book came out, uh, but uh, as you saw in that article that I sent to you in, in prep for the show – Lamar Hunt Jr. and his uh, his company, uh, I guess it's called Loretto Sports, is talking about a uh, a minor league North American Hockey League uh, team in Kansas City. Hopefully, with the name Scouts, I wonder what he might know or have known about his dad's potential thought about the team back then, or maybe just wasn't on his radar. I I suspect that beyond the Chiefs and his other uh, endeavors, right, the uh, NASL Soccer Dallas Tornado was more on right. Lamar Hunt's mind at that point uh, versus trying to save a franchise in Kansas City for hockey. One of us would have to ask Lamar Hunt Jr. that. Uh, I don't know if he ever talked to his dad about it. You're right. Uh, Lamar Sr. Uh, was a big soccer guy, huge soccer guy. Uh, he, he just may not have had any interest in hockey. He may not have been a fan. Uh, or he may have looked into it and thought, that's a bad business 
proposition, <laughs> and, and it was. But uh, to your point, I think uh, – I'm pretty sure the team that uh, Hunt Jr. is uh, putting in uh, in Johnson County, Kansas, is actually going to be a member of the North American Hockey League, which is an American junior hockey league. Uh, and players can go there and develop, and, and, and most of the time they they go to uh, universities and, and play uh, collegiate hockey with the hope of uh, – being drafted by National Hockey League franchises. It's also important to point out that Lamar Hunt Jr., for a few years now, has owned a, a team in the ECHL, a minor league team. It used to be known as the Missouri Mavericks. Uh, now they're known as the Kansas City Mavericks. They actually play an arena uh, out west of Kansas City in the western suburb of Independence, Missouri. Independence uh, being of Harry S. Truman fame. That's uh that's his hometown. But uh, Hunt is very involved also in developing youth hockey in Kansas City. Uh, Lamar Hunt Jr. is heavily invested uh, both with his wallet and his heart in promoting hockey in Kansas City. And I don't know the man, but I respect the man for the fact that he's promoting the sport. All right. So very interesting. And, and I w- would love to go into that and maybe we'll reach out to uh, Mr. Hunt Jr. And, uh, and maybe talk to our old pal, Michael McCambridge, who uh, I think did the seminal uh, biography of Lamar Hunt. I, the scouts did not come up in that conversation, but I wonder uh, if it was sort of in his calculus. So maybe we can talk about the denouement of this uh, Kansas City version of the team, because uh, we kind of hinted at it. Uh, there seemed to be kind of the proverbial writing on the wall, even as they were uh, going to Japan to play this uh, exhibition series, uh, maybe you can kind of walk us through some of the highlights or arguably lowlights of the demise of the team continuing in Kansas City and how they wound up going to Denver as the first iteration of an NHL franchise there. Uh, I, I think I pretty much answered that question previously. It, it was a bust as a business. They didn't win. Um, they didn't promote their players. Uh, the owners didn't have enough money. Uh, the economy went in the tank in the mid and late 70s. Uh, it, it was it was it was a lot of bad luck. Uh, this team had bad luck in other ways. The trainer killed himself. I mean, he he literally committed suicide early during the first season. I mean, how bizarre is that? Uh, and then in the second season, they bring in, probably in an attempt to sell tickets, they bring in the biggest badass in the National Hockey League, Steve Durbano. And it just, uh, in a lot of ways, it was a gong show. And, you know, I'm reticent to say that, but I'm a reporter. And that's a fact. But I will tell you this. The, the biggest pleasure I got in writing this book was interviewing the former players interviewing the team's attorney, interviewing the young assistant trainer who had to take over when his mentor shot himself in the head with a gun. Uh, These men were all great, and they have fond memories of Kansas City. They never missed a paycheck, just in case anybody's wondering. Uh, They basically say in the book why they feel that uh, the Kansas City scouts failed as a franchise and as a business. And I mentioned at the outset, Tim, I I think both the hockey team and the NBA team would have been better suited if Kemper Arena had been constructed in very affluent Johnson County, Kansas. That's per capita still to this day and was then one of the most affluent metropolitan counties in the United States. A lot of wealth there was then, was today. That was put to a vote of Johnson County voters, and it failed on the same day that uh, Nixon buried George McGovern in the 72 presidential election. Okay, another opportunity, uh, option was to build what, was, what turned out to be Kemper Arena out at the Truman Sports Complex, next to Arrowhead Stadium and Royal Stadium. That would have been better than down in the Mississippi, or not the Mississippi River Bottoms. The, I live by the Mississippi River, the Missouri River Bottoms, down in a stockyard. Uh, the, the arena was built down in the stockyard because of the American Royal Rodeo, you know, and there, there weren't any restaurants down there. There weren't any bars. That's another thing. You know, fans, if they wanted to go to a game and go to someplace, uh, an establishment to have a pregame drink or a steak, uh, 
to get a steak in that neighborhood, they'd had to, they had to go to the stockyard and kill the cow, dress the cow, cook the cow. You know, I mean, it, it, I will say this: down in that area of of town, you weren't going to get mugged. It, it wasn't dangerous in that regard. There just wasn't anything else around. Other than there was one restaurant, the Golden Ox, and I'm, I imagine they did pretty good business. Other than that, it was a bunch of stockyards, and the smell was great. That sounds like the Chicago WHA franchise, but I digress. Um, sure, the amphitheater. Okay, so that's really, I mean, all of that is, is uh, it can seem to be endlessly fascinating. So let me ask you this sort of one last question then. Obviously, the, the team's heritage now goes and lives in, uh, in New Jersey in the uh, Prudential Center in Newark. How much, from what you can tell, have the Devils uh, remembered uh, or choose to remember the heritage of the team prior, in particular, the first two years as Kansas City, if at all. I think I think at the at the Rock they've got both a logo of the Scouts and the Rockies. The history is not mentioned in media guides. Oh, you tell me, Tim. Do teams even print media guides anymore? I mean, but no, the Devils have never acknowledged uh, their previous incarnations in either Kansas City or Colorado, and. I mean that that's fine. It's it's their business, you know. They've changed owners over the years and and whatnot. But uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, the franchise started in Kansas City, had a stop in Denver, and then stopped in uh, New Jersey. And I tell you what, this slow start for the Devils has got people on their fan sites going bonkers. My my my. Yeah, uh, with great expectations this year. Let me ask you this then, one last part of that question then is, is since you went so deep with the players and the coaches and, and some of the, the the people that were just part of the, the whole experience during these, well, four years, but two seasons, uh, do they feel neglected, forgotten, whatever, by the current franchise and or the NHL? Or, you know, do they feel like they, you know, do they just not care? It was just part of their, quote unquote, pro hockey experience. And that's just the way it was. I don't think they give a crap what the New Jersey Devils think of them or if they acknowledge them most of these men if they're still alive have moved on robin burns uh, has moved on and had a wonderful life and become a multimillionaire. He invented the hockey visor and patented it i kid you not he invented the hockey visor um and became a nhl coach's agent uh, by the way robin burns uh cousin of the late uh, late great coach Pat Burns, who won a Stanley Cup with the New Jersey Devils. Uh, Dave Hudson's gone on to um, he created his own printing business, and uh, you know it it bills I think twenty two million dollars a year. Gary Crotto is very happy uh, um, to answer your question. I it, you know to be honest with you, if if you asked half the guys that played with the Kansas City Scouts, they might not know that the franchise still exists as the Devils. Uh, I just don't think after all these years it's uh, it's something they they think about. A guy like Jean Guy Legacy, a wonderful sense of humor, just like Robin Burns. Uh, uh, if you had posed that question to either one of those guys, they would have cleaned it up, the language for the podcast, but they would have had a much more hilarious answer than I just gave you. Well, we don't mind it being clean or not. We just want the uh, the, the the true oh. the true memories oh. and, and the understandings because uh, that's it's. I figured this was at least a PG thirteen podcast. Well, uh, this is also oral history, right? And and okay. in All some right. respect, it's 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 this is going to be you know both when we issue it as well as just over time, people will stumble across it and will know that this is one of the only conversations around the two year experience that were the scouts and. Any further, you know, thoughts or, or people that you want to suggest and stuff that still may have these memories, we'd love to go go deeper in it because you know, without sort of these conversations and sort of uh, this uh, the recording of this stuff, it's going to get truly lost. All right, terrific. Last question, and then I'll uh, let you promote and go. Then, uh, do you think Kansas City could again have an NHL franchise, especially given that Sprint Center, which still is devoid of other uh, of a an NBA or NHL franchise? Yes, but it won't be an expansion franchise. Uh, it will be a team that okay. Here, here, here's the deal. If Lamar Hunt Jr.'s siblings, including Clark, the brother who runs the Chiefs, if that family collectively gets together and says, "Okay, let's go buy this franchise," I'm not going to mention any franchises. People know the names of the NHL franchises right now that it seem to be 
in peril uh, with attendance and, and whatnot, I could see that Clark uh, the the Hunt family with Clark, Lamar, I think there's another brother, maybe two sisters, and then them bringing in partners, investors. I could see them going after an existing NHL team, but it will not be an expansion team. I'm, I'm almost certain of that. All right, you uh, New Jersey Devils fans, uh, this is uh, your history lesson. And uh, once uh, you show up for the next game at the uh, at the Rock at the Prudential Center, why don't you uh, point your uh, your pals in the bleachers there uh, to this little episode about the uh, the origin story of those New Jersey Devils uh, via the Colorado Rockies in Denver for a bunch of years, uh, and uh, regale your friends with all of your newfound knowledge about the Kansas City Scouts. Where thanks to Detroit Treasure, the uh, the DJ name that never was. <laughs> I wonder. Uh, I wonder if Troy ever uh, imagined himself possibly using that name, or maybe even lending it out to uh, to somebody in the broadcast world because it's it's an awesome name, and uh, you know it's right up there with the uh, Johnny Darks of the world, right? But uh, no, it's it's a great name, but it's also a more uh, uh, interesting and great book, and I highly encourage you uh, you find it. It's called Icing on the Plains: The Rough Ride of Kansas City's NHL Scouts. Uh, it is in paperback form. You can get it in hardcover. Paperbacks uh, probably set you back a little less. Uh, and of course, uh, let's see, it's pu- published by, who is it published by? Yes, Balboa Press. And uh, it's 278 pages of Kansas City Scouts NHL historical goodness and uh, and not so goodness. It's 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 a fun read. It's, it's really well researched, uh, as you can imagine, uh, with Troy's uh, journalistic chops. You can buy it uh, anywhere good books are found, of course. Uh, but uh, if you want to find it conveniently uh, on our website, you can, of course, do so. Just search up this episode. And I think it's episode 139. Oh, my God. I can't imagine. Thir- 139 of these episodes. Unbelievable. And more to come, uh, if you can believe that. But uh, search up this episode with Troy Treasure. Uh, you'll find uh, uh, a, a convenient link uh, to the book. You'll uh, be whisked away to Amazon and a couple of other booksellers. And uh, feel free to make a purchase there. We'll get a couple of shekels of love. We appreciate that. And Troy gets a, a couple of shekels as well for uh, selling another copy of the book. And uh, we, we love to keep this story uh, alive. And we encourage you to uh, delve more deeply into the story that uh, only our hour plus uh, could only scratch the surface of. We also uh, encourage you, uh, once you're at the site, goodseatsstillavailable.com, to hang around and check out all their other episodes. We've got all of them there for you. You can download them or stream them, do whatever you want with them. Uh, you can find all of our social media feeds there, too. They're one click away. If you want to find us on Twitter, we're at Good Seats Still. You want to find us on uh, Instagram, you'll find us at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, on Facebook, there's a page devoted to us. You can also click around and find our email uh, link there on the website or just do it to us directly if you'd like. And that's hello at GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. It's pretty simple, pretty easy to remember. Uh, what else? Oh, on the website, you can find a, a link, of course, to our weekly newsletter. It's uh, nothing hugely special, but at least it gives you a couple of days advance notice about what we're going to be uh, broadcasting this next week and, uh, you know, be uh, get an early sneak peek or a sneak listen, if you will, into uh, into into the show and what's going to be what's going to be on before the average Joe, uh, you know, walking down the street who has no no idea. Uh, and uh, why not be in the know and and, uh, you know, be uh, happy in the excitement of, of, of an early listen of of this show for what it's worth. And uh, for what it's worth, we also want to say thank you, as we always do, or we try to at least, to our pal Jerry Payne and uh, his uh, motley crew there at Podfly Productions. You're interested in getting involved in the podcast game, learning about how to edit or get it, uh, all the pieces put together or production tips, all that kind of stuff. Podfly is the best place. I guarantee it. Check them out. Podfly Productions, you'll find them at podfly.net. Okay, my name is Tim you know your name. I appreciate your listening. And uh, who knows what's uh, in store for next week. But uh, when we see you again, that's uh, we'll, we'll talk to you then. Okay. Right, thanks for listening. We'll, we'll see you. Bye.